joke for you. Two old, worn out bills, a 20 and a $1 bill, met on a conveyor belt at the Federal Reserve Bank. As they came to the end of their serviceable lives, they began to talk about where they had been. And the 20 reminisced about traveling all over the country. He said, I've been to the finest restaurants, the Boardway theater shows, Las Vegas, Atlantic City, oh, a Caribbean cruise even. Where have you been? He asked the $1 bill. And she said, I've been to the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the <laughs> Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Lutheran Church. And, and then the 20 looked at her and said, what's a church? <laughs> it's our fifth week traveling through our Lenten journey to hope. And now we've talked about helpful traveling companions who direct us. And we've talked about our God-given talents mattering to those who are on the journey with us. And we've talked about staying alert and awake to help those in need. Today we talk about money. Every journey requires money. What role does money play in the life of the church? Are we using it well or is it using us? The scripture we heard today was from Mark and is commonly known as the widow's mite. How many have heard this story before? Many preachers will use the widow as an example of sacrificial giving. We know it's a teachable moment because Jesus calls his disciples over. Anytime he says, come on over here, I've got something to tell you, we know it's both teachable for the disciples and for us. And he calls them over and he points out the many people giving much and one poor woman throwing in two insignificant coins. She gave about two tenths of a cent. She would need another six coins if she was to buy the smallest sacrifice, a dove. She didn't contribute much. And yet Jesus highlights her contribution because even though she had very little, she gave her all. The rich people gave from their excess. Their donation may not have even made a significant dent in their wealth. The insignificant amount that the widow gave was her whole livelihood. Maybe this story should be called the widow's might, M-I-G-H-T, instead of might, M-I-T, because she, more than others, depended on God's pro provision to survive. She had a mighty faith, and she was a mighty giver. When Frank checked on my sermon development when we were away this week, his response was, huh, why did she put all her money in the treasury? Don't you think God would want her to have even half to live on? Well, many people, many Bible scholars agree with Frank. They suggest that Jesus was actually railing against the religious institutions that taught this woman to offer her tiny coins as though God would demand that much of a sacrifice from the very poor of the world. Let me explain a bit. Under the Hebrew inheritance law, a deceased man's property went to his eldest son, not the wife. Women didn't generally, <coughs> uh, Israelite women didn't generally own property. The Romans, the Greeks, different story, but we're talking about the Israelites. So the widow would be at the mercy of her son, or if she had not produced a son, at the mercy of her husband's family, or if they no longer wanted her, possibly she could go back to her birth family. We see the biblical concern throughout the Bible. The widow is evidence that they need the protection because of their inferior position. If a woman somehow, maybe she's you know, part of her family is Greek and part of her family is Israelite, if somehow she did manage to inherit the wealth. Then 
the knowledge the scribes, the knowledgeable teachers of the law, they would swoop in and offer to manage their property of the deceased. These, because after all, these matters would just be too weighty for a woman to take care of herself. So we see one verse before the, the scripture that's printed in your bulletin. We see Jesus' anger towards the scribes, and he accuses them of parading around in flowing robes while exploiting the weak. Your pew Bibles say they were devouring the widow's homes. So much for the temple protection of widows. Also, in antiquity, people could be wealthy without half, having actually having coin money because the economy was primarily based on barter. Money was always, the money that was produced was always managed exclusively by the elite members of society. So it's no accident that the only time money is mentioned in the Jesus tradition is when there is talk of taxes, tolls, and um, contributions to the temple. That makes the temple both a religious institution and an economic institution. So Jesus upsets the money changers' tables and the dove sellers' benches not because he's angry that commerce is ha happening in the temple. That had gone on for centuries. But because the money changers and the um, dove sellers are are taking too much money. They are getting wealthy on temple business. Oldberg Hendricks, the author of Politics of Jesus, says that Simon, the, who was the son of the rabbi, the famous rabbi, Gamaliel, fought against the escalating temple prices in the first century, just after Jesus, just about the same time. The price for the doves was lowered 99% and the dove sellers still made a profit. So it's not just the fact that they're exchanging money and selling doves, it's the fact that they're doing it at excessive profits. The temple was big business and Jerusalem was a company town. The priests and the scribes made a living by taking a cut off the temple sacrifices. They made the rules and then they got rich by enforcing the rules. So we come to today's story where Jesus is sitting in the court of women, the outer court where the temple offerings were placed in 13 flute-shaped receptacles along the wall. Each person would come forward and their name would be announced and the amount of their gift would be announced as they put it in. Now, can, should we do that this morning? <laughs> Maybe not. I imagine that Jesus, he's still mauling over the hypocrisy of the scribes and he's watching this widow give her last two small coins, all that she had to a system that is devouring her home. Viewed from this angle, Jesus' comments are not a quaint vignette about the superior piety of the poor, but rather a lament condemning the institution that motivates such an action. Interpreters suggest that Jesus was distressed that the temple had become big business, making the, Fadges, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes wealthy at the expense of the poor, the poor that they were supposed to be taking care of. I have to tell you that this passage makes me a little bit uncomfortable too, because I wear flowing robes, and the congregation's contributions pay for my wage. In fact, at just over $23,000, my salary compromises more than half of our 2012 budget. Now, we've planned to use another $14,000 to run our programs and maintain this building. 
That figure does not include the parsonage restoration. More than three quarters of our total budget is spent forming church. It's spent on ourselves. This fact makes me want to ask, is supporting the church good stewardship? Or would Jesus cringe as the money was placed in the offering plate? I believe we are good stewards of God's resources. People need the Lord. Part of the money that I said was for self-care is spent inviting people from our neighborhood to come and learn about Jesus and grow in discipleship and grow in their relationship with the Lord. Worship, Bible study, and small groups like our youth group give people the room to wrestle with the questions and the doubts that they may have and grow stronger in their faith. That's the first part of our mission statements, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And the second part is to send them out into the world to transform it, to bring mercy and justice to corners of the world where there is suffering and hunger. Also, I say we are being good stewards of God's resources because we have planned to spend $7,000 of our budget on apportionments and missions. That represents about 16%. The budgets, by the way, are printed in your insert, a, a summary and a summary of where we are on that budget. Apportioned funds are used to support the United Methodist Church ministry, both locally, nationally, and throughout the whole world. Because our contributions are connected with the contributions of all the other local churches, we are linked together to make a big difference, huge improvements in the world that no one church could do alone. The United Methodist Church has four areas of ministry focus. Number one, the Global Health Initiative addresses the diseases of poverty like malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS. <coughs> Number two, ministry with the poor. Number three, leadership development. And number four, church growth and development. Today I'd like to go a little bit deeper into the Global Health Initiative, a specific one called Imagine No Malaria. You heard me tell the ch children about how the disease of malaria works. Well, the United Methodist Church is really confident that we can overcome malaria in Africa. Why? Because we've been getting results. When I first started learning about Imagine No More Malaria, children were dying at the rate of every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds. But then when I was preparing this sermon, some of the literature that's been around for a while in the United Methodist Church said that children were dying every 45 seconds. That we had, instead of a million people dying, only 800,000 were dying each year. And now, when I go on the website this morning to recheck my figures, children are dying only every 60 seconds. Now that trend is a sign of hope. It shows that we're making a difference. But children are still dying every 60 seconds. So there's more work to be done. Our team of malaria experts in Africa have been working tirelessly in this life and death fight to improve healthcare infrastructure also. So a sustained victory over malaria will be possible. The United Church operates hospitals and clinics throughout Africa. Our facilities are a vital trusted part of the health care system. When the roads in Africa end, we are there. Beyond the reach of other aid organizations, beyond the reach even of their own governments. Bed nets, yep, yeah, we do the bed nets too. But we're a key partner in the bed nets. Mostly we're in the distribution end. We've uh, helped deliver millions of nets, but we don't just give the nets to a community and walk away. We go into that community and we train someone in the community to be a malaria health care worker 
so that they will teach others how to use the nets correctly because if they're not used, they don't work. And they also teach them how to get medicine when people do get malaria, how to request it from the government, how to request it from the aid organizations. Working side by side with the local communities, the national departments of health, and other nonprofits is precisely the way that we're going to beat this disease. We are good stewards of God's money because we are part of a network of God's workers alleviating suffering and preventing death around the globe in some of the poorest areas. But also because here at Delmont we give beyond our United Methodist apportionments for work in missions. I forecast that we will have no trouble meeting our missions goal of $1,000 this year. We've already done winter relief, and in that case, we fed 35 people spiritually and actual food. Then we participated in the Lenten lunches in Glen Burnie, and we fed spiritually and with real nutrition, or not real, not spiritual, is real nutrition. We fed them with food, and we fed them with um, the Bible, 65 people. That lunch, by not, charging, by not charging the organization for cooking that lunch, they gained almost $300 for other projects that work with the homeless in the Glen Burnie area. We've begun to collect supplies for the Homeless Resource Day, and we are sending on, from last week's collection, $375 to the one great hour of sharing. If we continue with the endeavors that we've already initiated last year, like the back-to-school backpacks and the food baskets at Christmas and Thanksgiving, we are going to meet our goals. In fact, we're probably going to exceed our goals, and we're going to be setting a trend of fulfilling our long-term call to action goal, goal of actually increasing mission giving $1,000 each year. I find it interesting that we've already built and paid for a strong foundation for ministry and mission. And so that if we grow in numbers or we grow in donations, that money is so easily ready for transforming the world rather than spending more on the building and spending more on ourselves. Money is necessary for the journey to hope. We're ready. We're a lean, mean, transforming machine. I recognize that money talk is uncomfortable. Yet, it's a major theme running throughout the Bible, so it's something that we need to stop, think about, and learn. Today's reading can teach us about sacrificial giving, which is the way this story is normally preached. It can help us evaluate if we are good stewards of God's resources, using our money to transform lives. And there's a third message here, too. Mark is such a clever author. So he's giving us a hint, a premonition, a reminder of what is to come. This is the last time that Jesus is in the temple. And as he leaves, as he left that temple that day, he predict, predicted its destruction. It's his last teaching right in the temple. He calls his disciples to him. He makes this observation about the widow. Out of her po poverty, the widow gave without reservation all she had. She gave her livelihood. She gave her very life. Jesus also does this for us. He poured himself out for us so that we might have life. We hear this stated clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that by his very poverty we might become rich. Amen.